great pleasure to be here to give this keynote address at the 7th International Workshop on Sustainable Road Freight. And today I'm going to talk about vehicle technologies for minimizing carbon emissions. So my talk is going to have a bit of background. I want to talk about the broad sets of options for minimizing carbon emissions from vehicles. I'd like to talk about urban delivery, uh, a little bit about long haul, I want to talk about hydrogen and draw some conclusions. So a bit of background. This graph shows the carbon emissions uh, generated by the world and uh, various mitigation, possible mitigation strategies. You can see that had we started mitigating seriously in 2000 at a rate of 4% per year, we'd have been able to keep the world within the one and a half degree uh, temperature rise limit. From now, from 2020, if we emit the same emissions as this year for the next eight years, we will reach the complete total carbon budget for one and a half degrees C rise. Uh, any more emissions after that will have to be extracted from the atmosphere, uh, which is very difficult territory. So if we, want, if we start right now and mitigate all emissions by 2040, which would be a very aggressive timetable, we can only just reach that one and a half degrees C limit. What you can see from this is it's absolutely critical that we emit, reduce emissions as quickly as possible. We can't actually wait decades for new technologies to be developed. We have to use technologies that are available now and implement them as quickly as possible if there's to be any chance of keeping the Earth's temperature rise within one and a half degrees. Here's some other interesting background. This is the uh, freight levels in various countries in millions of ton kilometers as a function of time. You can see that the really dominant players here are China, USA and India. Now, greenhouse gas emissions are essentially proportional to the, not, not exactly, but near enough proportional to uh, ton kilometers traveled. And so you can see that mitigating emissions in, in those major economies, China, USA, India, of course, in Europe, uh, that's our, our top priority. We can do a lot in the UK, but it's not really going to make much difference to the world's uh, carbon emissions. It's really impo important to focus. Everybody's got to play their part, but we have to think a lot about developing countries, particularly China and India and the USA. What are the options for decarbonizing? Well, we can reduce demand for logistics and for goods. We can improve logistics efficiency. We can improve vehicle energy efficiency. And I'd be happy to talk about that on another occasion, but that's all kinds of things like improved aerodynamics, improved rolling resistance, lower rolling resistance tires, refrigeration technologies, driver performance. Uh, high capacity vehicles are an extremely good way to reduce emissions by 20 or 30 percent. There's a, lot, there are a number of different things we have to do. And it's actually important, no matter what route we take, it's important that we do those things which improve vehicle en energy efficiency. What I want to talk about today mainly is cleaner vehicle energy sources. So I'll start, about, start by talking about urban delivery. Uh, and here's a little kind of schematic of the way that UK logistics works. There's a backbone network of motorways and what we call A-roads with logistics hubs, distribution centers and warehouses located at key nodes around the network. And many vehicles just drive up and down the network from hub to hub. But other vehicles drive from the network into city centers and those vehicles can be electrified like this parcel delivery vehicle uh, which can do multi-drops for 100 kilometers a day, easily on a battery. Uh, this kind of vehicle, which is do, does uh, deliveries to convenience stores and small supermarkets in city centers, it can also be battery electric. Uh, it can perform an operation from 
a hub on the edge of the city and do several drops around stores in the city centre and get back to its hub uh, on a battery without much difficulty. Similarly, refuse collection vehicles can do the same kind of thing. My belief is in, in about 10 years time, we'll look back and we'll say, why did we ever use diesel powered vehicles for these operations? They're rapidly becoming electrified uh, in the UK and Europe. And I think that that is the trend. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, uh, a very powerful trend driven a lot by air quality con considerations, but very helpful from the carbon emissions point of view. All of the batteries in these vehicles can be less than about 85 kilowatts, particularly if there is some so-called opportunity charging, a little bit of charging at strategic locations around the network when the vehicles stop. Uh, a, uh, a vehicle de making delivery to a, a store can stop for half an hour while it's uh, being unloaded, can be charging up, and that can give enough charge to get it a good way around the rest of its journey, at least to the next stop. This is happening now. As far as a long haul is concerned, when we think about the options, we need to consider a number of things. One is re-energizing time. How long does it take to fuel the vehicle? The vehicle range, the flexibility in logistics terms, uh, and of course, the costs of infrastructure of vehicles, of energy and the carbon emissions. So these are all issues that need to be taken into account. Here is a picture of a gas powered vehicle, which was part of a trial of 40 biogas trucks that we were involved with uh, one of our partners, Waitrose, uh, which is a supermarket. And these vehicles were driven for a year in, in uh, service. And here are some of the results. So the vehicles use about 20% more energy than the gas vehicles, about 20% more energy than the diesel vehicle because the spark ignition gas engine is less efficient than the diesel. On the other hand, they cost, they cost a lot less to run because of the tax situation on gas. And in fact, they use about, they, they cost about 30% less uh, in fuel terms. And that gives them uh, a two year payback period on the investment in this gas engine. So this is a highly attractive thing for a fleet operator to do, to use a vehicle, a gas vehicle. The emissions reduction is about 12%. That, that was measured. We measured that uh, across this fleet of 40, bio, uh, 40 uh, CNG trucks. Uh, it's 12% if they're fueled on compressed natural gas, and it's about 72% if they're fueled on biogas. Now, the big question here is whether there's enough biogas to go around. My belief is actually that there isn't, uh, that biogas isn't in fact a long-term solution for uh, UK's road freight vehicles and uh, because there simply isn't enough of it. And what there is, my opinion is that we should be using it for fueling ships and aircraft uh, and not trucks because trucks can be electrified. And I'm going to talk about that uh, next. So if we talk about electrification of major roads, the kind of system uh, that we need to use is one where we bring the electrons to the vehicle rather than carrying them in a box, in a battery. And the so-called electric road systems do that. The most attractive, in my opinion, is the Siemens e-highway system, which uses overhead catenary cables like a railway train uh, with two pantographs uh, required, one, one for positive and one for negative. Um, unlike a train which just has a single pantograph and uses the uh, um, th the rail as uh, as the ground. Uh, these vehicles can run, uh, can have small batteries. They can run from distribution center to distribution center along the, the motorway network, being fueled by electricity uh, from the grid as they go. And uh, as long as they have a small battery, they can get from the end of from from the junction of the motorway 20 or 30 kilometers certainly never more to uh, a distribution center and unload charge up and then come back to the main motorway network so that can be done with a small 
a small battery, which is very attractive. Uh, that small battery also can be used for um, resilience purposes if the, uh, the overhead cables stop working in, in a section, uh, then the battery will get the vehicle uh, onto the next section, and also for passing, for going through tunnels and under bridges, which may not be electrified. The alternative is a hydrogen-powered vehicle, like this Nikola vehicle. The attraction of the hydrogen-powered vehicles is they're fast refueling, they have a good range, the but most importantly, the logistics models are kind of as now. You don't have to do anything different. Uh, these vehicles can allegedly uh, travel the same places that a diesel-powered vehicle can travel. They use, they could use green hydrogen generated by electrolysis or so-called blue hydrogen generated by steam, methane reforming and carbon capture and storage. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's think about green hydrogen by electrolysis. And I want to start off by talking about efficiencies and efficiencies of various possible vehicle uh, solutions. If we had started off with 100 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity generated by a wind turbine or solar panels or something, hydroelectric system or possibly even nuclear, uh, when we transmit it via the grid, that can be done at about a 90% efficiency, so we end up with 90 kilowatt hours after uh, after that. Um, if we want to put that into a battery electric vehicle, there is a, an AC to DC conversion and a battery charging process and a battery discharging process. All of that round trip, if you're lucky, is about 85% efficient. Uh, and then, of course, the motor of the vehicle is not perfectly efficient, They're about 90% efficient on the vehicle. So you end up with about 69 kilowatt hours. When you multiply all those efficiencies together, you end up with about 69 kilowatt hours at the wheels of the vehicle. That's not bad. 69% uh, efficient process from renewable, from, wind, from windmill to wheel, wind turbine to wheel. So that's the battery electric vehicle route. If you go via a hydrogen route with that same 100 kilowatt hours of electricity, convert it to DC and then use it to electrolyze, electrolyze water. Uh, the electrolysis process is about 75% efficient. You can then compress the hydrogen, transport it in your vehicle, then run it back through a fuel cell. And what the fuel cell does is generates electricity again. And that's unfortunately due to the second law of thermodynamics that can't be any more than about 50% efficient. And you take that electricity and you put it into your electric vehicle at about 90% efficiency, you end up with 23 kilowatt hours at the wheel. So you've thrown away 77 kilowatt hours of electricity as heat in the process of converting from electricity to hydrogen and then hydrogen back to electricity again. So this is an extremely inefficient thing to do. You're throwing away a lot of your valuable renewable electricity. Uh, and that means actually that you need a lot of renewable electricity if you're going to power all the UK's freight vehicles by the hydrogen route because you have to have enough electricity to throw away 77% of it in order to only use 23% of it. So you need a lot more to start with. If you go via the electric roads route, then you take your 100 kilowatt hours of electricity, you put it through uh, you transmit it via the grid, you convert it to DC, and you put it into your ERS vehicle, your electric vehicle, which is about 90% efficient, and that gives you 77 kilowatt hours at the wheel. That means you've thrown away 23 uh, kilowatt hours of electricity. So this is the most efficient way that you can possibly run an electric vehicle. There is no more efficient way. What's happening here is we're taking electricity directly from the grid, going through one conversion from AC to DC, and going straight into the electric motor. Don't even have to go in and out of a battery to do that, although you might somehow. So this is the most efficient way we can we can do it. Now, if you think about these three pathways, well, actually, I'd like to like to think about the two outer pathways, the most efficient and the least efficient. If you have a certain amount of freight to transport around the country, there's a certain amount of energy needed to do that. 
and we know what that is. Uh, and you can use that to calculate how much energy you need, how much renewable electricity you need at the start of the process. And you can see that if your process is 77% efficient, you need much less energy, renewable electricity, than if your process is 23% efficient. And I can show that graphically for you on the next page. In fact, there's a factor of 3.3 between those two. I'll show it to you on the next page. And this, this shows you how much area of wind turbines you would need in order to generate the renewable electricity to power all the UK's long haul freight vehicles. And you can see that if you used the, the electric road system, ERS, you need about 10.6 gigawatts of power, which would be, uh, if there were three megawatt turbines, about three and a half thousand megawatt, three and a half thousand turbines, and a land area of about 5,000 square kilometers. Uh, if you, and that's shown to scale in the picture, if you use green hydrogen, you need a lot more electricity to start with because you're going to throw away a lot of it through inefficiency of the electrolysis process and then in the fuel cell. And actually you need about 36 gigawatts of electricity for the UK's road freight vehicle. And that compares to 31 gigawatts, which is the UK average in 2019. So the UK day and night use an average of 31 gigawatts. If we wanted to use green hydrogen powered vehicles, we'd have to more than double that. Uh, because of the inefficiency. That would take a land area of 18,000 square kilometers. Shown to scale on this diagram, it's about as big as the entire area of Wales. Uh, and so it's a really huge amount of electricity needed. The factor of 3.3 between these two graphs means that you need 3.3 times more wind turbines. And that, unfortunately, is going to cost somebody 3.3 times more. The electricity that you need to run your hydrogen powered vehicles will cost 3.3 times more than running direct ERS electric road system vehicles. So you have to ask the question that when people actually have to make a decision about which solution they're going to use, are they going to use a solution which costs X per ton kilometer, or are they going to use a system which costs 3.3 times x per ton kilometer. Which one will they invest in? And I think we'll find that people will invest in electric vehicles rather than hydrogen powered vehicles. The simple economics just don't stack up for hydrogen. And here are some of the assumptions that are used to make that chart. Here's another way of looking at hydrogen versus electric roads. And I think this is quite interesting. What I've done here is to just take decarbonisation rate published by the UK government for the electricity grid and assume that we use this electricity to power heavy goods vehicles, either by uh, the electric road system or by green hydrogen. And the assumption here is that we just suddenly install the implement infrastructure today in 2020. Of course, that's not what's going to happen. It would, whatever infrastructure we do whatever system we use it's going to appear over time but if we just assume that it was going to be all installed today then what would we see well diesel vehicle is uh, around 100 uh, grams of co2 per ton kilometer and uh, that's almost the same as green hydrogen in 2020 so green hydrogen would be about the same as now in terms of emissions if we could do it uh, the electric road system would be one third of that, one over 3.3, and so it would generate about 30 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer. And what you can see is that both of these would decarbonize over time as electricity grid decarbonizes. Of course, uh, the decarbonization picture would be a bit different if we were to really do green hydrogen, but that's a different story. What you can see is that it won't be till 2020, 2035 before the green hydrogen solution reaches is as good as the electric road solution is now. So it would take 15 years to, to be as good. And I'll go back to what I said at the start of this talk, that it's really important that we decarbonize quickly. And you can see that if you go for a green hydrogen route, 
the decarbonisation rate will be far slower because of the vast amount more, 3.3 times more energy needed for the green hydrogen vehicles than for the electric road vehicles. And that will cause a long delay in uh, the decarbonisation rate. Uh, that doesn't account at all for the fact uh, that you need to build a vast amount of infrastructure to do the green hydrogen route uh, of, uh, of um, renewable electricity and electrolysis plants. Uh, so the technology readiness level of that is all much lower than for electric uh, roads. The alternative is to use what's called blue hydrogen. It's generated by steam methane reforming, SMR, and carbon capture and storage. We generate hydrogen from methane, we capture the carbon, we put it in a hole in the ground uh, underneath, in a, in, a, in a salt cavern uh, underneath the, uh, the North Sea or somewhere like that. If we were to take 100 kilowatt hours of methane, natural gas, then we could go through the steam methane reforming process, which is reasonably efficient. That would give hydrogen, shown here in pink again. We could compress the hydrogen, we could transport it, we could put it through the fuel cell, which is 50% efficient, put it into our electric vehicle, and we'd end up with 9, 29 kilowatt hours of electricity. Of course, we would have to do the carbon capture and storage step as well. That's the so-called blue hydrogen route. Now, there is a way that we could run an electric vehicle off methane, uh, and it's a slightly roundabout way, but nevertheless, it is possible. And the way you would do that is you'd use what's called a combined cycle gas turbine plant. Most power in the UK currently is generated by combined cycle gas turbine plants. Uh, they are very, very efficient. The most efficient ones are up to 64% uh, thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, so they can take methane, 100 kilowatt hours of methane, and generate 64 kilowatt hours of electricity, which is pretty good. If you transmit that via the electricity grid, go through your AC to DC, conver AC to DC conversion and put it in an electric road, you would end up with 49 kilowatt hours of electricity. So if your objective was to use methane to power heavy goods vehicles, you're much better to do it, again, by an electric road system uh, because you get 49 kilowatt hours instead of 29 kilowatt hours. You actually get 70% uh, more bang for your buck by the electric road system. Of course, you still need to do the carbon capture and storage thing on both sides of this equation. Otherwise, uh, you'll just be emitting the carbon into the atmosphere, which defeats the purpose. But in fact, the effectiveness of carbon capture and storage in both cases is about the same. Both of them involve combustion of methane, uh, which has to be captured from flue gases. And the efficiency of that actually at maximum is about 90%. Uh, that means that 10% of the flue gas of carbon dioxide will escape into the atmosphere, even with the most efficient carbon capture and storage technologies. So in fact, blue hydrogen can't be made, can't get us to net zero because it's always going to emit 10% uh, of carbon. That's another story. But what we can see is that it's much more effective to go the electric road route than, um, uh, than the hydrogen route. So if we were to electrify our major road network with the e-highway system, what would be the main features of that? Well, we've got, we've done a study on this recently, and there's a little white paper, which I'd be happy to give you. We've concluded that if we were to electrify 7,500 kilometres of the UK's motorways and key A roads, uh, that that would uh, decarbonize about two thirds of freight kilometers in the UK. And the other one third is mainly in urban areas, and that could be serviced by the battery electric vehicles that I mentioned before. The e highway infrastructure, well, it's pretty well developed. There have been four major trials in Europe, one in the US, um, and uh, there are ongoing trials at the moment on motorways uh, in rural real life. 
The cost for doing this in the UK, we think, for that 7,500 kilometres of motorways, would be about £20 billion. And you can compare that £20 billion to the Department of Transport's road building budget for the years 2020 to 2025, which is £28 billion. So for almost a third less than the Department of Transport's current road building budget, we could equip the, the UK road network with sufficient e-highways to decarbonise two-thirds of heavy goods vehicle kilometres. So that's pretty impressive, actually. And you can compare that to uh, the UK's big rail project, which is going on at the moment. It's called HS2. That's uh, going to be essentially one main railway line, and that is going to be costed, is currently costed at £106 billion. So a fifth of the cost of HS2 to decarbonise essentially all the UK's road freight vehicles, uh, the heavy vehicles. The substations, a big part of the cost is building substations. They can be shared with charging infrastructure for charging cars at motorway service stations. The infrastructure can also be shared with 5G and um, other infrastructure for connected and autonomous vehicles for communications, vehicle communications. Our estimate is that the, the infrastructure uh, based on sale of electricity to heavy goods vehicles, the infrastructure can pay back uh, on a, uh, a private sector investment in 15 years uh, and could be rolled out, could be physically built by 2040. As far as the vehicle is concerned, we think that a series hybrid type of vehicle is the right way to go, particularly during the transition, 15 year transition period, because during that period, you've got some vehicles which will still have to run on unelectrified motorways. The batteries in these vehicles can all be less than about 85 kilowatt hours. Uh, the vehicle payback period, according to our, our calculations, can be about one and a half years. These vehicles are so much more energy efficient um, that uh, and the electricity is sufficiently low cost that that can pay back in one and a half years. And the system can be done with almost full fuel tax recovery for the UK government. So this is a triple win. The infrastructure provider can be paid back in a reasonable time of 15 years. The vehicle operators can be paid back in one and a half years for buying their electric vehicles. And the government can get full diesel full amount of tax that it's currently getting from diesel uh, excise duty. Uh, and all of that happens because this electric road system is so energy efficient that it leaves a lot of headroom for financial, uh, for, for uh, economic savings. So let me draw some conclusions. All decarbonisation plans need the best possible energy efficiency. We need to do as much as we can in terms of aerodynamics, in terms of uh, low rolling resistance tyres, light weighting, high capacity vehicles, uh, and so on. That's taken as red, and we just need to start doing that stuff. It can all be done now. Uh, electric urban delivery is coming. Uh, one of the attraction, attractive things about that is it's generating the supply chains we need for long haul vehicles, supply chains for batteries, for uh, drivetrains, and, uh, and so on, control systems. Gas is a reasonable interim solution. Uh, it gives 12 to 15 percent decarbonisation. Where vehicles can be run on biogas, it's a lot better than that. Um, but unfortunately, there's not enough biogas to go around for the long term. Green hydrogen by electrolysis is very inefficient. It requires an excessive amount of renewable electricity. That has very high economic costs. Uh, and uh, I didn't talk about electricity storage, but uh, there are other ways to, ex to store electricity which are much more efficient and much better than using green hydrogen, which has been proposed. And the time, time scale is highly questionable. The amount of infrastructure that would have to be built to generate green hydrogen for the UK's road vehicle fleet would be excessive. As far as blue hydrogen is concerned, you need 70% uh, more gas 
to do blue hydrogen vehicle than simply to use the electricity in a power station and electric uh, in a combined cycle power station and the ARS vehicle. Uh, the problem with all that additional gas is that causes energy security problems and a, and a significant trade deficit for the country. So it's not a great uh, um, not a great strategy for the country as a whole. As far as electric road system is concerned, it's the lowest possible energy consumption, the lowest possible carbon emissions. It can be done uh, at a reasonable economic cost, which pays back the fleet operators, the infrastructure providers, and the UK government. The technology is high technology readiness, it's well tested, and can be implemented immediately. And the combination for the UK of a, nat a natural national electric road system and battery electric vehicles for urban delivery would deliver uh, decarbonisation of most of the UK road fr freight operations by about 2035 or 2040. So that does seem like a reasonable way to go for the UK. It's not necessarily uh, the best way to go for other parts of the world. And I hope that during this conference, we will be able to think about how we can go forward as an overall global community to decarbonize all of our freight vehicles in all of our geographies by 2045. So I look forward to seeing you all uh, through the rest of the conference and be happy to answer any questions now.